The end result of emotional absence is a sense of feeling that you are not seen and not heard and that you are irrelevant. Hi, I'm Charmin Kimbrough from the Marriage Recovery Center and I have a few thoughts today to share about the spouse who is emotionally absent or where there is emotional withdrawal or disconnection in the relationship. First, I do think it is important to consider that every person you come in contact with is actually offering you a different level of emotional connection, meaning there's it's not as black and white as either it's absent or it's there. There's lots of gray area that is going to be based upon their own journey, their, their learning, their trauma, their, um, the nurturing, what they've been taught, what their capacity is in the moment, and whatever their level of maturity. Like all of that plays into how much people offer you who they really are. So a shallow relationship or in something that lacks emotional depth does not necessarily mean that, that it is emotionally absent. There has to be some consideration of just the, the growth journey that people are on. However, when a relationship is driven by a hierarchy of power and control, or it's driven by fear or shame, which translates into hiding, the main goal is to control the facade to manage the narrative so as to not become exposed or to lose the security of being the one in control. So by security, I mean that the world works for them, that they know, again, they know, they know what to expect. They know how things are going to go, what will or will not be asked of them and that they will not be exposed, especially if um, there's a lot of shame and fear in the backdrop. So they will not be exposed as weak or lost, and it all feels under control. So security for this person is, is not found in exposing their heart to another person and connecting, because that is the requirement for emotional connection. It is found in controlling the narrative the greater the hiding, the greater their felt need to hide who they really are, the wider the emotional divide. So here are some ways that you may be feeling the emotional absence in your marriage. One is that, you know, we are taught that good communication, good conversation is like bouncing a ball to someone and then they bounce it back. Where there is emotional absence, it's more like you bounce the ball to them and they either slam it back or take it and go home. There's no interaction, the words just fall flat or they roll off into the abyss somewhere or they get slammed into the abyss somewhere. I think of playing ping pong as a kid, mostly with my brothers and you know typically there is going to be some sibling rivalry and competition in there, but a lot of times it wasn't really about playing the game. It wasn't, there wasn't the back and forth. It really was about slamming the ball so that it hit the table. It was still within the rules for them, still within the rules, but there was no way that I could even remotely appropriately hit it back. It was either an equal and opposite slam, but because of the force and direction, it would go out into the abyss somewhere, or I didn't even connect with it. It just went somewhere, right? It was really not that much fun. Um, my return shot would be, um, you know, sort of like uh, the reaction you get when you're in a poor conversation. Your reactive response is such that it equally inappropriate at that point. There's no connection. It does not make for a meaningful game. It's the same type of feeling as having a conversation with someone who's emotionally absent. It is a competition where there is only one winner, not a collective um, 
not a collective compilation of just playing the game. With an emotionally absent person too, any interaction is much more logistical in nature. There is not a thoughtful exchange of ideas. Even opinions are stated as matter of fact with no room to reason or to challenge. Interactions are super superficial. Naming statements of fact again, saying that kind of tongue in cheek without room to question or add understanding or meaning. No give or take of thoughts or ideas, no emotional introspection, or no emotional curiosity. There's no exploring of the perspectives or experiences. There's very much a sense that there is only one perspective and everything else that doesn't make sense is nonsense. The emotionally absent life is a facade. There is a difference between being emotionally expressive and emotionally connected, meaning someone who is emotionally expressive. People can be very emotionally expressive. Think angry outbursts or arrogant tirades or being passionate about something. So they can be expressive without being emotionally connected. Because a facade is a sham, there is little to no true substance that you can connect to. There's, there's nothing there. You cannot connect to a lie. It's just a house of cards. So while you might be, de be deceived into believing something about that person, like, you know, I think there has to be room to give yourself to validate your own experience, you felt connected to this person, there comes a point at which you realize that they are only connected to the facade they're upholding, not to you, the person they are misleading. So where you might have felt connected, they were just maintaining the facade. Their connection is to the, their own story. And then at some point you begin to feel that emotional absence as you realize that any points of emotional connection that you thought you had or that resonated with you were simply a part of the story at the time, the facade being presented at the time. The end result of emotional absence is a sense of feeling that you are not seen and not heard and that you are irrelevant to them. The darker side of emotional absence is using emotional withdrawal as the weapon of choice to get you to shut up and leave them alone or to punish you for whatever reason, particularly if you are not following their script for their narrative. In other words, they can manage you by emotionally withdrawing to coerce you to either chase after them or to fall back in line with the narrative in some way, to sit down and shut up or leave them alone, not ask anything of them, um, or to give them something that they want. So all kinds of ways that people sometimes will use emotional withdrawal as a weapon to manipulate you, to get what they want one way or another. I think, again, important to note that withdrawal in and of itself is not necessarily a weapon because I think, you know, for all of us, there is, um, there is a need for solitude and time for self-reflection in our own lives. And so in and of itself, withdrawing because of a boundary for whatever reason, or withdrawing just because you need the solitude to think through who you are and where you're going, or they need that, that doesn't mean it is automatically a weapon or that it's destructive. The key is what happens next, right? So having solitude, as a healthy aspect of life also requires that when you're trying to connect that you swing back around to provide space for reconnection but someone who uses emotional withdrawal as a weapon actually doesn't make room to reconnect on the other side it's only meant to create an environment in which um, either you have to do all of the work to reconnect or it's to get you in line in some way. Ultimately, it is destructive. It is lazy and it is passive aggressive. So it's one of those tools of emotional abuse that actually um, probably creates 
the most havoc. It's emotionally withdrawing so that you as a victim feel totally disconnected and alone and irrelevant. Being emotionally present on the other hand, so flipping it to the other side a little bit, requires introspective maturity. Remember I said just a minute ago, you know, withdrawing in and of itself for solitude isn't bad because it does require you to be or someone to be emotionally introspective. They've got to be able to pay attention to what's going on with them, their own selves. But it also means that you must know and accept yourself for who you are, flaws and all, um, with an orientation toward continually growing and maturing and showing up in the world, being authentic and true to who you are. It's not a facade. So that means living authentically, living our life authentically, and letting that be the testimony of who we are, rather than trying to just control a narrative, but interacting with that. This is what you're bringing to the table. That's what they're bringing to the table. And being able to talk about that together, building something together that you love to be a part of. That is exactly what emotional connection looks like. You know, admittedly, we all start out in life completely codependent little narcissistic monsters, both ends of the spectrum. So we are totally dependent on people and we definitely don't know how to do anything. We have no capacity to do anything for our own selves. So milestones of life require that more and more we learn to do for our own selves and be interdependent in relationships with other people because we are created to be in connection. So somewhere along the way, life does have a way of compelling us to have to show up and know who we are and where we're going, or we end up just being disconnected from people. So healthy looks like being authentic, showing up with authenticity, humility, reciprocity, curiosity, mutuality, freedom in relationships. And it means, it requires, again, this is mutuality and reciprocity right here, having room, making room for others to express themselves with the capacity to allow the differences without being, you know, put into a place of fear, or shame, or guilt, or, um, whatever, while intermingling with the logistics of life. So making room for other people to be different, interconnecting with them, in being interdependent with them, while mingling the logistics of life, like you're living alongside of other people. So how do you do that knowing who you are, making room for them to know who they are, and, and connecting with each other emotionally, it's not about one person winning over the other or taking the ball and going home, so to speak. You have to work to consider your own authentic footing, who you are and where you're going, how you want to show up in the world, and to thoughtfully consider these three things. Either to continue to invite your spouse to do his or her work, and it is work, to interact more authentically, not just according to the facade and to expose their real self to you. That is the only way we can emotionally connect. Um, or to continue living with them, trying to stay well, so to speak. So continue living with them in the emotionally shallow relationship, understanding that it is going to look different than what you thought it was. Um, or your third option is to set them free, to live according to their own facade without you. Because again, you cannot emotionally connect to someone who's only connecting to their story and you may not have the capacity to stay in that kind of relationship. In any event, with all three of these, you have to make room for grief. This is not what you thought it was going to be. Even if your spouse re-engages in a way that you're growing something, there's still transitional grief in that. Um, but then, of course, if it ends totally the other direction, you're grieving everything you thought or hoped um, the relationship would be. So 
that's a whole nother topic of its own. I just am one to always say you have to make room for grief. So all that to say, um, as you're thinking about where you are in your relationship and really what's going on, um, you probably have a lot of things you're thinking about, a lot of things you'd like to unpack. So if you would like to do that unpacking more specifically in your own relationship um, or to find practical ways um, to be personally more authentic and emotionally deep, we would love to help you. So please feel free to reach out to us through our website, themarriagerecoverycenter.com or to call the client care team at 206-219-0145. And we would love to see how we can help you just unravel the things going on in your life. So I do hope that this has been helpful and I look forward to chatting again soon.